We've been so lucky with the speakers on this Amnesty uh, Belfast Pride lecture over recent years, from, from Panty Bliss to, to John Burko uh, to last year Ruth Davidson, and they've all brought something really special, their own perspectives, their own stories, their own experiences, their own challenges to us, and they've educated us and informed us, and often uh, what we've looked for as well is inspirational, is inspiration, and I think uh, what we're going to get uh, this evening is all of the above, and as we've asked uh, our lecturer uh, this evening, Una Malali, I suppose to, to bring her experiences to date on travelling that journey uh, towards LGBTI equality in Ireland, reflecting on the progress made on both sides of the border and those battles still to be won and what we can learn from each other. We know there are still battles ahead um, and we are determined uh, to stand, Amnesty is determined to stand uh, with the LGBTI community here in Northern Ireland in fighting through every one of those. Not just the battle for equal marriage, which is the one that gains the headlines and to our delight brings the thousands, the tens of thousands onto the streets of this city whenever we ask people to do. And that is so inspirational and it is breaking the taboos and it's, it's, a, it's a, I think, it's, it's emblematic of uh, how much things have changed. Um, but it's it is a totem for the other battles still to be fought and won, and I'm sure we'll reflect on some of those uh, this evening. So Una's going to give her, uh, her lecture, and then we're delighted, uh, as we always are every year, to welcome on stage here uh, our great friend, broadcaster William Crawley, who is going to engage in a bit of an interview, Q&A, audience discussion, a um, bit of challenge, no doubt, to Una as well, as he always does. And we hope that that's really going to bring uh, the evening alive in terms of involving you as well in the discourse um, but for now, uh, I want to introduce our great speaker this evening, Una Mullally. Una, as you will be very familiar, is an Irish Times columnist, writes uh, regularly for that paper and for others. Uh, but as well as that, is the author, wrote In the Name of Love, which is an oral history of the marriage equality campaign in the South, one that has inspired uh, us on this side of the border as well. But she wasn't just a writer and observer, she was also an activist there, uh, a key advocate in different ways, uh, and continues to fight those fights. And right now she is doing a very important job. She's been appointed by the Minister for uh, Children and Youth Affairs in the South Catherine Zapponi to, uh, to lead, to chair, to be the independent chair of the group putting together the National Youth LGBT Strategy. And again, that's an important piece of work that, that we are looking to uh, from this side of the border as well. So. Uh, can you give a great Belfast Pride welcome to our lecturer this evening, Una Mullally. Hi everyone. Thanks so much. Um, it's, such a, it's such an honour to be here. Um, so thanks to Amnesty and, and to everyone to... Uh, everyone for having me and for coming here to, to hear this. I'm going to just talk a little bit about that journey uh, to marriage equality in the South. Um, and I'd just like to start with a memory uh, from over two years ago, uh, reflecting on, on the referendum, on, the, on the, the, from memory from a year ago, really reflecting on the anniversary of the referendum. And it's a piece that I wrote uh, reflecting on that. So I just thought I'd open them with that. Um, when I look back on the referendum now, I don't really think about the count centre or the high pressure TV debates or even the celebration after the win. I think about the canvas. Dublin itself, a city I was very familiar with, opened up the driveways and estates and blocks of flats and cul-de-sacs I'd never been in became even more familiar. The smell of blossoms in the suburbs, the shouts of children playing, the barks of suspicious dogs, the creak of gates and tones of doorbells were a soundtrack to a march. Handshakes and phone numbers and lifts and umbrellas were exchanged. People joked about how great canvases were for getting dates. Unfamiliar streets became highlighted lines on maps. The quality of one flyer over another was debated. These ones seemed to work well. Handfuls of badges were stuffed in pockets and reams of stickers were pulled off rolls. This stuff appeared like magic, rustled up by our bosses in HQ, the lieutenants to our foot soldiers. There are moments of togetherness that words cannot do justice. The bond of a team, a band, a family, a movement. In these bonds, 
there is an emotional shorthand a shared experience creates. On the canvas, we did not just meet humanity at the doors, we found it in each other. And those are my memories. On an early canvas in a very leafy part of Dublin 4, myself and my friend Fiona called to a door and an elderly man answered. He seemed a little suspicious and taken aback. But when we explained that we were canvassing on, on behalf of Yes Equality, a quiet smile broadened and he thanked us for the leaflets. And as we walked out of the driveway, we turned to watch him through a large front window that offered a view into the sitting room. He walked over to the couch where another elderly man sat in his slippers. He handed him the leaflet and they both smiled, expressing the recognisable tenderness of a couple. Outside a hurling match in Kilkenny, a mountain of a man observed the canvas from behind a barrier. Eventually, he, a steward, came out to talk to us as the match ended. Up from Dublin, is it? <laughs> Myself and my girlfriend went into the automatic spiel about the importance of the referendum being carried, ending with, and would you consider voting yes yourself? And he looked at us quizzically and we wondered where was it all about to go wrong? <laughs> Just said, Shrinky. <laughs> I remember canvassing in Cavan and a woman starting to well up when I handed her a flyer on the door. My son, she began, trailing off in tears. I'm voting yes more than you can ever understand. I think about the mother who brought her young lesbian daughter out to the door. The teenager was too young to vote, but she was collecting all of the different yes equality leaflets to keep in a scrapbook. I think of the shirtless man covered in tattoos holding a baby into the doorway of his flat saying, don't worry, love, you've got three votes here. I think of the middle-aged couple arm in arm on their way to a rugby match when we were canvassing outside the Aviva Stadium. No, the man exclaimed when I tried to hand him a leaflet. And as they walked by, his wife turned to me and mouthed behind her back, I'm voting yes. <laughs> Humanity in all its vast, beautiful range with all its small gestures. They call that time just after sunrise or just before sunset the magic hour. And you know what it's like. There's a calmness and a stillness in the air. Everything looks better. Sound seems somewhat softer. And in the magic hour, there's a feeling of contentment perhaps it has something to do with the beauty of the light or the way the day seems not yet begun or not yet finished and therefore so open to possibilities. What was the year like after the referendum? For many of us, the subsequent weeks were like one long magic hour. Shoulders untensed, people slept better, campaigners took holidays and then life continued. There was work and weddings and pregnancies and deaths. There were relationships to recalibration plans to be waters, but there were also new bonds, 1,201,607 little prisms of light, bordering on a rainbow, connecting everyone who put an X in the thaw box. And sometimes memories evaporate if you don't write them down. During the marriage quality campaign, I sat down at my desk a few hours after being diagnosed with cancer on Friday the 13th of March 2015 and started a diary for the first time since I was a teenager, which I've continued every day since. The first words I wrote in it were John Didion's, life changes fast, life changes in the instant. You sit down to dinner and life, as you know, it just ends. But sometimes do life just doesn't change fast. Sometimes it doesn't change in the instant. Sometimes life just goes on. That's a piece I wrote in the Times, the anniversary of the referendum, and I'm repeating it tonight because sometimes I need to remind myself of what happened and who owns that fight and who owns that victory and what it meant to me. And I think about that piece now and it's quite soppy and sentimental, but maybe that's what it meant. And over two years on, where do we go from here really? because none of it matters unless it's part of broader social change. Marriage equality in the Republic of Ireland does not matter, big picture, if it's just a blip or an outlier on a graph. And it's hard to say that something so monumental mightn't matter, but it won't unless it means something bigger. And this, of course, includes the ludicrous fact as you are all very well aware of, when I go for a drink later with my Belfast friends, that I have more rights when it comes to my relationship on this island than they do. And it is absurd, and needs to be repeated that it is absurd, 
that a gay couple can get married in Dundalk, but not in Uri, that are Kenny, but not Strabane, Clonus, but not Enniskillen. And it's absurd, too, and needs to be restated as absurd, that politicians continue to veto the equality and rights of people in Northern Ireland, disrespecting the will of the people who overwhelmingly support marriage equality. On what basis is that being done other than prejudice? There is very obviously a different political and social context here, not least how progress in marriage equality has been blocked by the Petition of Concern mechanism. But marriage equality needs to be a red line issue when the storm and negotiations resume. The pressure is on and it cannot be let off. But there does tend to be a lot of talk around the winning of hearts and minds when it comes to LGBT rights. For me, in the aftermath of us in the South achieving marriage equality, what that really means is how to make the issue of marriage equality important to straight people or people who might not automatically or necessarily agree with you from the outset. And what I found unusual a while after the referendum is how straight people would talk about it. Sometimes it felt that my heterosexual brethren were even more enthusiastic about those months <laughs> and the outcome than the LGBT community. And I was always be like, oh yeah, yeah, why, why is that? And I have to admit that sometimes it maybe tense up a little. Maybe I was possessive of the victory. Maybe I was possessive of what that victory meant to my community. Maybe I was a little offended by the idea that it was as important to straight people as it was to LGBT people. But then I realized that they were actually talking about a different side to the referendum. And clearly the impact was so visceral beyond those who were directly affected by the issue. Why? I think it's something we need to think about and dissect. And I think it's because they got on board not to do with their LGBT friends, although that was a part of it, or not because they felt passionately about this cause, but they got on board because of home. And thinking of home is a power that we can all harness when we think about these issues. What does home feel like? And do you want to live there? And do you feel as though it reflects you? Because I think what happened after that 62% vote is that people's relationship with their home changed. I think a lot of people, wherever they're living, walk around a bit frustrated with home. We listen to the news and we see what's going on in society and think, oh, for fuck's sake. Our homelands embarrass us sometimes. Our politicians say stupid things. There's corruption and really weird priorities and ridiculous scandals and futile fights. How often do you Google flights after picking up the newspaper in the morning? So I think for straight people, a yes vote offered the chance to wake up and listen to the radio or read the newspaper or talk to a family member and not have to think, oh, for God's sake, again. It was a chance to be able to imagine something different, something good that we did together. It gave straight people the opportunity to assert themselves as tolerant, to say, okay, this issue doesn't directly affect me, but I want to live somewhere that values equality and fairness. People were bombarded with messages about their home not being ready for this, but they decided they were, and they wanted their home to be nicer and kinder. But in order for people who are not in the LGBT community to harness that feeling, in order for wider society to recognise the benefits that marriage equality can bring, they need to get on board. And then in its aftermath, you can witness the stampede of conservative politicians trying to claim the victory. It's all ahead of you, Belfast. <laughs> One helpful aspect of a delay in marriage equality progressing in Northern Ireland, because it is just a delay, is the fact that many lessons have been learned elsewhere, as well as the easily dismantled arguments of those who oppose it, in the same way that so many lessons were learned from the US in terms of the, the Republic of Ireland's messaging around marriage equality. And the reason that is, is because we find, curiously, that the opposition to marriage equality 
is very uniform around the world. For me, one of the most nonsense arguments that we're up against is how asking for equality is somehow oppressing other people. That in wanting to live an equal life, you are somehow infringing upon someone else's, a stranger, someone you've never met or encountered or even heard before. And that argument is nonsense. And the people who make it also know that it is nonsense. Yet it remains a curiously seductive and popular argument, primarily because for some reason, people are drawn towards a contrarian narrative. And the other reason that it's a nonsense argument is because it is dishonest and needs to be called that. It's a facade behind which the real argument hides. We know that arguments against LGBT rights have always been based in prejudice, but that overt prejudice has become less and less acceptable. The fact that it's become less acceptable is a victory, even if it has created arguments that have to hide. Certain elements of the media and politics seem to be enamored by this prejudice dressed up as edginess or see holding obnoxious points of view as going against the grain. Certain elements of the media fall over themselves to listen to the so-called unexpected voice, even if that voice represents no one but the person using it, which in the marriage equality debate is generally a very specific trope, a gay man who does not want marriage equality. Most of the time, these people are grasping for attention, they're desperate for it, but their voices are amplified by a media looking for angles to an argument that has already been won. And you do have people who feel that their religious beliefs, which they are very much entitled to, supersede everything else, even equality for their fellow citizens. Yet at the same time, when the problematic aspects of such religious beliefs are challenged, all of a sudden, the doctrine they espouse becomes fragile and precious, almost incapable of standing up to any kind of rigor, despite the fact that it in itself is leveraged to attack and oppress others. And that needs to be called out. Nobody needs to tell you about the context of the importance of religious freedom here, much more so than in many other jurisdictions and that religious freedom must be protected and preserved. But rela religion in and of itself cannot be leveraged to deny people their rights, nor can it be used as a shield for discrimination to hide behind. Marriage equality isn't just an issue for lesbian and gay couples, we know that. And it's not just about weddings, although they're very fun. And it's not just about extending an institution to people who feel they've been excluded from it. It is about recognizing that all of us are equal and deserve to be seen and treated as such. I have always been a bigger fan of the equality side of marriage equality. The politicians who oppose marriage equality need to reflect and be interrogated about the impetuses that are leading them to do so. so Prejudice, discrimination, meanness, and a lack of charity and fairness are not Christian values. Arguments that oppose marriage equality often define equality itself as some kind of seesaw or finite source, as if when someone gets more rights, others must deplete, or that there's only a certain amount of equality available to go around. Equality is not a fossil fuel, and if one person in, is unequal in society, then we are all off kilter. Arlene Foster worries about marriage being redefined. If this institution she, she so values is so entrenched in history, so rock solid, then how could it possibly wilt and wither when the gays get their hands on it? She says that the abuse she receives online from supporters of marriage equality reinforces her intention to continue to block it. Someone being abused online is very unfortunate. I've been on the other side of that myself. But you cannot equate receiving abuse because you are opposed to equality with reinforcing inequality itself. That is not just a disproportionate response, it's just plain petty. The DUP did not invent marriage, 
and they do not get to say who has access to it. They do not get to say what defines it or what redefines it. The referendum had a galvanizing effect and it had a mobilizing effect. It had a cathartic effect by flushing out many opinions, by airing many points of view. It had a healing effect in terms of the positive conversations people had. But it also had a profoundly damaging effect and that's something we talk less about. It had a traumatic effect and a hurtful effect. And I, for one, certainly am not over the negative impact it had. The permission that was given to people to air their incredibly hurtful views, views that demeaned LGBT people, the hate mail, the vile words on the doorsteps. I think I'm a thick-skinned, confident person, the loving partner, supportive family, great friends, supportive working environment. I got very upset thinking about people who dealt with that rhetoric throughout the campaign who are much more isolated than I am. So yes, the referendum was amazing, as you will hear time and time again, but it was also horrible. And having referenda on people's equality is a terrible idea. Allowing a majority to decide on the rights of a minority is a terrible idea. It caused a lot of people great hurt and great anger and those emotions were compounded because LGBT people did not have permission to express those things themselves. We had to toe the line, to be respectful, to be polite, and to carry ourselves in a way that many, in many cases our opposition did not deserve or indeed act that way themselves. The referendum for me was a daily trauma and the continuing opposition to LGBT rights here and elsewhere continues to be traumatic for so many people and we should be allowed to label it as such. The foundation of LGBT rights as we see during Pride all the time has always been visibility and coming out has always been the building block of that visibility. But what I'm concerned about is a kind of invisibility and that is the ongoing disconnection between North and South on many issues, including those of LGBT equality and women's rights. And a lot of the time, people in the South are to blame for this, assuming that their equality is everyone's equality. There may be widespread ignorance in the UK as to what the social, political and cultural landscape is in the North, but while it's easy to roll our eyes at English journalists and their public discovering the DUP for the first time in the aftermath of the recent election, I think it's fair to say that there is similar ignorance amongst people in the Republic of Ireland. This is more than regrettable, especially when it comes to issues of LGBT equality and women's reproductive rights, because we are fighting and have fought similar battles against similar oppression and opposition. We have a lot to learn from each other, but I'm not convinced that such an exchange is happening at the level that it should be. It can be hard enough to get advocacy groups in different counties to talk to each other, never mind those north and south, but we're wasting time and energy by not doing so. So I think that further developing all Ireland forums on LGBT rights and women's rights could do a lot to bridge that gap. As many people in this room probably know, campaigning on issues that are very personal can be exhausting and burnout is very real. The longer this particular marriage equality battle goes on, people will start to worry about losing momentum, start to worry about infighting. But the shift in society, north and south, has already occurred. It's just time for legislation to catch up. And there are also odd benefits for doing things the hard way. The longer the fight, the more fundamental the win. There are positive aspects of something taking longer than it should. Because fighting for something is an opportunity to galvanize and organize and mobilize. I remember being in a gay club the night of the referendum result and people in their early 20s were asking, what's next? The marriage referendum politicized a substantial chunk of a generation for many, it was the first time they were truly politically engaged. Now, can you imagine the feeling of power that creates, that you went out into your neighbourhoods, your communities, your counties, your country, and fought for something you truly believed in, the result of which would change the world, and won. And you saw how it was won as well, by people from different communities, strangers, friends, coming together and working towards the greater good. 
And this power will be felt by people in the North too when marriage equality becomes a reality soon. And that feeling of power has fueled an impatience in especially young people. And impatience is good. Impatience makes things happen. And that impatience has been converted into energy for the Repeal the Eighth campaign and the wider campaign for all Ireland reproductive rights. When marriage equality was won in the South, I kept being asked in interviews with foreign journalists, how could Ireland have marriage equality and not legal abortion? And the answer is very simple. Misogyny is far more embedded in our societies than homophobia is. And it's important to unpick that misogyny and call it out because it's misogyny that also underpins homophobia and transphobia. And the same people and institutions who opposed marriage equality, opposed the Gender Recognition Act, opposed not just abortion and not just reproductive rights, but who opposed divorce, who opposed proper sex education in schools, who opposed secular school ownership and who opposed contraception. And that is not a coincidence. But I also think it's important to talk about how marriage equality is not a panacea. It is not a silver bullet. We have to talk about the less marketable issues of LGBT poverty, homelessness, workplace discrimination, bullying, rejection from family and friends, and what essentially amounts to an LGBT mental health crisis that we're in the midst of. These things do not have catchy messages or slogans, and they require resources functioning strategies, funding, and large-scale attitudinal change. One of the reasons that I think marriage equality is succeeding globally is because there is no economic opposition to marriage equality. One of the interesting aspects of charting the, or chairing the National LGBTI Plus Youth Strategy, which is the first of its kind in the world, is how young people repeat that while marriage equality is great and everything, it doesn't actually make a good deal of difference to their day-to-day -day lives. They remain the most vulnerable people in the LGBTI plus community. And as a community, we have to ask ourselves, why for so many years have we concentrated on gaining rights for adults? And Pride is a good time to think about these things because it is a coming together. And of course, unity is what makes society better, not division. Arguing with people on the internet who are never going to change their minds does not make things better. Reaching out to people who are on the, front, who are on the fence and bringing them with, with you makes things better. Respectfully challenging people's privilege makes things better. Because when you are accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. It's not. When you are accustomed to people being silenced, their voices growing in volume can feel deafening. They're not, we're just talking. I hope that that talking can continue north and south as an exchange, as a learning experience, and actually as real and meaningful solidarity. A lot of what made society better in the south was just that, talking. Sometimes that talking was very painful, and sometimes I know it can feel as though we're talking in circles and going over the same arguments and not seeing the results we want yet but I have so much respect for the campaigners here still pushing, still changing hearts and minds, and still talking, so let's keep at it. Thank you. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit and then I'll bring you in, and uh, that was great. You've given us kind of a manifesto of the future in some ways about what comes next. We're, we're not kind of in that change, obviously. But you made a very strong argument against referenda yeah. around equality as he's a moral argument. You talked about how horrible it can be, exhilarating but painful and horrible. It's the moral argument that interests me, actually, because we have had some people here say, you know, we may be stalled here on this one issue because of the petition of concern, the veto, uh, the legal action that's going through the courts and all the rest. Why don't we just do, some people say, why don't we just do what they did in the south of Ireland and have a referendum mm. and cut through all of that? You might even get all party agreement to that. It's been suggested. I'm not sure you would. But why don't we just do that? What would you say to those who make that suggestion? I think it's a bad idea. You know, I think it's, first of all, it's very risky. 
Um, and if you lose a referendum, you can't just have one a month later. Um, except in Scotland. It's got, except in, and, and in certain EU constitutional yeah. issues. And, so and, or, um, yeah. But generally, generally. Uh, you can't have one shortly after that. And so I do think it's very risky. Uh, judicial, like going through the courts, going through legislation, it's obviously more arduous, it's more mm. boring, it doesn't have the drama, but you don't get dragged into the, like I think what can be typified as referendum kind of carnage um, in terms of public debate. Um, and I don't really care what, what anybody says, I think it would have been much preferable, yay, to... Um, <laughs> oh, forget the for, question, for, just have a beer. <laughs> 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 No, but I mean, there was an arg I mean, there was a constant argument mm. in, you know, in terms of that that our that you know the republic didn't need a referendum at all, and I would have been very much on on mm. on that side of things. Um, now, perhaps if legislation was introduced, it could be challenged. But there was, you know, there was no gender in in the constitution regarding marriage, so it could have actually been introduced. I think in the end, because of you know, the ambiguity of the constitution on that, you know, maybe was the best idea, but you cannot underestimate the social cost of that, you know? And I think for me, I mean, I, that's what I was saying, you know, if I find that traumatic and I feel like I've got a thick enough skin mm. and I've been banging on about these things for a good few years, I mean, what does, you know, the 16 year old kid who isn't out to their folks in West Cork or Northwest Donegal, feel about it when the parents are colluding in the homophobia of someone on TG Tower or 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 T E. You know, that that's no joke. <laughs> you know, and and you know, mental health issues haven't exactly fallen off the map since marriage equality or since the referendum. It put an awful lot of toxic stuff out into there. And you can look at it two ways that it was cathartic, it flushed out loads of opinions. And yeah, that's true. But at the same time, I mean I cried every day the referendum, and I ain't a crier. And and you know, friends of mine whose whose parents have passed away are crying when they're seeing posters saying up that say every child deserves a mother and a father. You know, these things are really hard. And I think that if you can get them through in terms of legislation or through the courts, you're better off. I mean, just as as the cost. But I do think also in that struggle. You know, it would would that amount of young people be galvanised right now if there wasn't a referendum? I don't know. I mean, the canvassing drive in the south is the largest act of LGBT visibility ever in the country. You know, so is it worth it? During that canvassing, did you ever change anyone's mind on their doorstep? I think so. Yeah. Um, Were they offering you an argument? Did you respond to an argument? Yeah, I think a couple of people might have been a bit you know, iffy, I mean, they always said, in the, we did canvassing training and it was always, if somebody's an absolute yes, tell them to vote, to get their friends to vote and then move on. If someone's an absolute no, they'll probably try and waste your time. And that happened, it was hard to get drawn into those arguments. Um, but like anything, I mean, I don't remember the particularly, I mean, some of the amazing canvassing doors, I remember more the really, really shitty, horrible things, you know? Um, and I think that's just human nature. You kind of remember negative stuff more so. But yeah, you know, I mean, there has to have been minds changed. And I think what, what people don't talk about enough is that, um, you know, marriage equality and, and class, because the highest turnouts were in very working class areas. Um, and I always knew, and I mean, I canvassed every day, as did many other people, or pretty much every day, that when you were going into a block of flats or a council estate, it was going to be absolutely grand mm -hmm. and the people would there be supporting you. But when you were going into the big giant mansions in you know, certain parts of Dublin, it was going to be a struggle. And I think that's you know, this idea that this was a so-called middle class, liberal issue or whatever is, is bullshit because it was in, I mean, I think Jobstown, West Tala had the highest vote in the, con in the country. Um, when, when you analyze, when you analyze the arguments that were made against uh, the yes vote, not just on the doors but on television and in, in our in columns on radio shows, 
was was the no always a religiously motivated no? Did you find a secular opposition to same-sex marriage? I think there was an attention-grabbing argument toward, uh, against it. Um, but did, what, you mean, did you detect a secular case for same against same-sex marriage? No, I mean I think there's an argument against marriage in general, you know, as, as a traditionally patriarchal institution, uh, yeah. as from a point of view where should we really be entering into a contract with the state because of our relationships? Mm. Should we be giving people treats, uh, you know, in society because they decide to do a contract with the state? But I don't recognize the sector now that I encountered. Yeah. I mean, I recognize loads of no's dressed up as that mm. uh, in radio debates and so on. Like the lexicography argument you know it's a definitional thing mm. you, which you said earlier you, you regard it as kind of disguised argument yeah the children argument was interesting i mean i, I obviously I, I i i covered some of this as a journalist so i wasn't living in the south during this but the children argument came to the fore in the posters from some of the on the on the no campaign what did you make of that argument when it came into the mix i just think it's kind of offensive i mean um I think first of all but it's strategically was that a really bad move i think no it was campaign? a bad move i think 10 years ago, 20 years ago, probably would have uh, been a good enough move. I think that, um, I think that the authority that Catholic lobby groups have on child protection is kind of gone. Um, I wonder why. <laughs> so I think that, that that really rubbed people up the wrong way. I also think that um, the people who were pushing that argument, which is, um, you know, the Catholic Church via the Iona Institute, funded from all, all sorts of different places, don't understand that families are diverse, you know, and, and don't understand that pretty much every single family, you know, or extended family has single parents or unmarried parents or separated people or divorced people or, you know, whatever, all the different makeup of that, and they're um, preaching that there is some kind of ideal way mm. to, 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 ha to raise children mm. uh, when, when people raise children in all sorts of circumstances and everybody's just doing their best most of the time. I think, I think the, the, the moment I knew that they'd lost the referendum was when the Every Child Deserves a Mother and Father posters went up because it was just that was offensive to so many people beyond the LGBT community. And in the middle ground as well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, people who were adopted or adopted, you know, foster parents, you know, single parents, everything. That was actually just saying, hang on a second, you are now just imposing your particular uh, worldview on, on, on people. And I think, I think that's And it also looked like an aesthetic historic connection between homosexuality and paedophilia just being deployed yeah. in the middle of a referendum. Yeah. Yeah. To some people it looked that way. I'm yeah. sure it wasn't intended that way, but it looked that way to some yeah. people. And again, when you're arguing that point, when you're being when when the Catholic Church is the biggest op opposition to it, it's very difficult to make that, that point. Um, what, what was your thirty second answer on the doorstep to people said the state has no right to redefine marriage? You're not redefining marriage, you're just giving people who don't have access to it access to the institution. And then someone might come back with, well, let, what about three people who want to get married or five people? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about two people entering into the existing contract. Usually mind. here when we have a discussion about this, I don't know, I mean, is this your experience? Two calls in for me. Yeah, two calls in for me. We get into polygamy and then into bestiality. Yeah, and I think that that's a classic. Um, I mean, you, you will listen to, you know, talk phone-in shows in, you know, Missouri yeah. and you'll hear the same thing. I mean, or, or all over... That is the classic thing, and one of the things that was very powerful in terms of people who were debating this stuff on TV or radio was don't get involved in distraction tactics. You have a message to sell to people about marriage equality and the fairness of it. Don't get hung up on sperm donation, surrogacy, marrying various, you know, bajillions of people or whatever, because that, that is essentially a, a distraction tactic. There's no way that um, marriage will be legally opened up to more than three people or four people or more than two people, whatever. So those kind of things were just distraction tactics. Not in Ireland, but maybe in Poland. 
Well. Or they're talking about it. Yeah, I mean, but that's not, that's Holland, right? Mm. That's another jurisdiction we're talking about. This is about. the fourth call now. Like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's, we're not talking about the law, you know, the laws of Holland. It's a slippery slope, you know. Well, can you know, I marry, can I I mean, marry the, the, the laws of Holland uh, don't have much holding in this jurisdiction, as far as I know. Yeah. What was the toughest, toughest <coughs> case that you encountered for you? Because not, not everybody who's opposed to same-sex marriage is uh, a horrible, evil person. No, there are decent, all. good people yeah. who hold, hold all kinds of views on these things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, was, what was the toughest um, encounter you had with someone? Um, Maybe it was on a television I think, program. Yeah, I think I was on, I was, I did a t uh, early on I did a TV debate in Irish on TG Cahar yeah. uh, with a guy who was quite, quite off the wall. Um, and... It was, I had been, I, as I said in that piece, I was diagnosed with stage three bowel cancer uh, in March of yeah. 2015. And this was maybe a week and a half before that had happened. And he was talking about all this like totally crazy stuff about um, how, I was saying loads of stuff about lesbians and how their relationships don't last as long. And just all this kind of like crazy, like weirdo pamphlet stuff. and and how lesbians get cancer. Um, that was, you know, just like this like huge high, higher rate of cancer or whatever. Yeah. And uh, yeah. for my dad happened to be watching it. I didn't tell him to watch it, obviously. I was just saying, this, for, you know, I was saying like, you know, <laughs> like, um, then show for us, like, blah, blah, you know, this is all like absolute rubbish, you know, just complete raw mesh, la, la. Um, and my dad rang me uh, after I was on it, and it was the first time my dad had ever rung me after I'd been on any television show or any radio show or anything. And uh, he was like, are you okay? You know, and he wouldn't be a man of feelings. Uh, and I was like, yeah, no. And he was like, why was he saying that stuff? Why was he saying, I was like, look, he's crazy, you know, just. And um, he was like, okay, it was just like completely bizarre. I was like, yeah, it was, it was. And then, Two weeks later, I was diagnosed with cancer, and I was like, "Shit! I hope my dad didn't think I'm going to have to vote now." <laughs> <laughs> so that was just really like you're you're yeah. sitting in a studio, and somebody is literally saying that you are, you know, yeah. subhuman essentially. So that was very difficult. Going to come to you in a second. Uh, one final question for me uh, on misogyny. Uh, if your analysis is, is right, and it's a pretty um, universal analysis you've offered about the uh, misogynistic roots of homophobia, transphobia, yeah. and other things. Uh, it, it's not a problem that straight people alone face, is it? Uh, there's misogyny within the LGBTQI community too. Yeah. Where do you encounter misogyny within the gay communities? I think it's quite, I mean, myself and my pals call it gaytriarchy. Mm. Um, I think it, it's like quite, quite commonplace, but I think that Anybody who is, you know, anybody who is close-minded or sexist is going to be sexist or close-minded or misogynistic or whatever. Your sexuality does not necessarily change that. I mean, you'd hope that being part of a minority would open you up to different points of view and make you, you know, consider the fact that feminist politics have done a lot for LGBT community, for example. But I think you encounter it any, anywhere, you know, and I think that I mean, I'm not, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of accepted misogyny amongst gay men. Um, amongst, you know, some get hashtag not all gay men. But I think that there is <laughs> a, a certain strain, strain of it that I encounter often. And, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, this alive. Can, can you give us some names? Well, some I, think, well I, think, no, I do think there is kind of an, sometimes with some, gay guys and allowed for disgust about female genitalia, you know? Mm. Like, ooh, vaginas and stuff like that. And that's kind of weird. Um, but I so, think- Sorry, everyone, I didn't know she was going to say that. Yeah, yeah but I think- <laughs> <laughs> you know, It's like, you came it's from- It's a monologue, home, so. yeah, it's a monologue. Um, it's a giant monologue. But, so I think that that's, that's, that, that, that is a, a, a thing. Obviously, if a straight guy says, ooh, vagina, you know, his pals are gonna be like, ooh, vagina. <laughs> um, so, so there's a dip, there's, there's, there's kind of permission to be, 
a bit more derogatory about female body parts to assert your own male homosexuality. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's cool. Uh, and, we, and we see it in the transphobia question as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. Which is certainly not restricted to yeah. the heterosexual community yeah. as a problem in terms of transphobic attitudes. And you only have to look at the issue, you know, the discrimination that a lot of lesbians have, mm -hmm. have propagated against trans women, for example. To see that that is absolutely you know true but milo yiannopoulos has often faced some of these criticisms you know as a gay man um and what he says about transphobic people and what he says about uh same-sex marriage that kind of thing uh, i had him in my mind when you were talking about not in, in you the had milo record. in your mind when, my you were talking, when you were when talking you were about gay men who were opposed to same-sex marriage <laughs> 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 Um, the, the sort of the Donald Trumpization of the question. Anyway, let's just pass on from that. Uh, who did you have in your mind? You were talking about the, uh, the guy who popped up on TV constantly in the South, uh, the gay man who was opposed to same-sex marriage. There's a couple of them, yeah. There's one or two? I'm not going to... You're not going to name them for so. fear of legal action. Okay. Questions from you, comments? Anywhere in the room? We do have a microphone, do we? We've got a couple of microphones moving around the room. Your chance to talk to, uh, to Una. Who's first? Over there. Two over there. Um, I'm going to try and alternate. Um, so think of a question this side of the room. We've got two over here. Go for it. I was just thinking, um, you know, love is a human right, and it's a very old liberation theme, and it's this kind of the irony that, you know, all these years later, that it's through the institution of equal marriage that you know, we're, we're pursuing it. I wonder if you could say a wee bit more. I, I liked the way you said that um, it was equality side of thing, which is as much as important to you. you maybe you could say a wee bit more about that. For people who love isn't necessarily about marriage, but the institutions and how do they that create that space so they can be part of this. And also you, you listed a number of other issues which are really important. And for me here, Northern Ireland education is one, the bullying. I think um, it's been reduced down to notes for guidance or something in relation to bullying in education. And how do you, harness that energy that in your case undoubtedly came through a referendum mm. but how do you harness that energy of people to look at there are other much more fundamental issues you know if kids are coming through schools and colleges and university and have no protections there mm. and then we wonder why there are suicides and wonder why there are mental health issues etc but um, how do we focus um government how we focus bodies how we focus the interest on those deeply fundamentally important issues um which for some are maybe way more important than the right to get married or not to get married. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, that, that uh, question about the equality side of, of marriage equality, I mean, that's, you know, a lot of people had to kind of wrestle with wanting to buy into what is essentially a conservative, um, you know, point of view, marriage, family, all that kind of stuff, a conservative construct, if you will. And for me, you know, I've never, necessarily been a fan of, of marriage per se or any kind of thing that tries to socially organize people and benefit mm -hmm. one group of people over another but having access to everything on an equality argument is hugely important mm -hmm. and if that you know I, I don't particularly maybe want to get married but I know loads of other people do and I know that having access to that is really important and I think that the horizon that LGBT kids have needs to be as broad as what their heterosexual peers have. Um, and I think that denying people options and, and access is wrong. Um, now you can go into, you know, what do we give up as queer people if, if we assimilate and all that kind of stuff. And, that, and that's, a, you know, another really broad conversation. Yeah. In terms of the education aspect, we're working on the National LGBTI plus youth strategy at the moment. You know, the Department of Education are, are on the oversight committee, they're at the table. Um, and it is about how do you basically try and create uh, a society whereby LGBTI plus young people have the exact same opportunities as their heterosexual counterparts and whereby there are obstacles and we know there are, how do we overcome those? That is a generation or two or three of change, but it can be instigated within the education system. And you're absolutely right about that. Um, 
and, and part, you know, there is amazing work being done by the likes of Shout Out, by the likes of Belong To, in breaking down those barriers, but it is slow and there is opposition to it. But it's part of a broader attitudinal behavioral change, I think, in society, and that is not going to happen overnight, but it can happen with policy if people are up for investing in that policy. Just on the back of that, do you, do you think marriage is, obviously you think marriage has historically been a patriarchal kind of uh, arrangement. Do you think it's unavoidably patriarchal or can it stop being patriarchal over time in the I future? I think when two women are in it, it's not very patriarchal. I think it can, no, we're, not, we're not putting people in the marriage yeah. that makes it patriarchal. It's the arrangement, the social arrangement is the argument that it, that it is patriarchal. I mean, it's possible for a woman to be sexist, for example. The yeah. fact that a woman's a woman doesn't mean she's free from sexism. The fact that two women in a marriage doesn't in itself rid them of the possibility that they're part of a patriarchal association. Yeah, I think not necessarily. I mean, I think that this is why the whole argument about, you know, redefining marriage and all that kind of stuff has always been quite a weak argument for me because I think that, um, you know, marriage changes and people's relationship changes and like, that's okay and what are you afraid of? I think in terms of marriage does not have to be patriarchal. It does not have to be conservative. Um, I when will it stop being patriarchal? Well, I think I mean I do set, like conti like that argument of having, you know, two women, for example, in a marriage, is a non-patriarchal construct. I think. I mean, their, if you, their particular marriage. Well, yeah, but you know, I think if you look at, for example, you know, the lesbian wage premium, mm -hmm. whereby people in society exist in a pay scale of straight men, gay men lesbian women and straight women. So in a society that discriminates against gay people, then why are lesbian women making more? And the answer is, and even when it, it, it's brought down to they don't leave the workforce because they're not having children, when those variables are also brought into it, lesbian women are still earning more than straight women. And the reason seems to be that because the gender roles within their relationships are more egalitarian. And so they're not necessarily prioritizing a man's job over a, a woman's job. And I think that is a non-patriarchal development. It exists within, yeah. you know, it exists within the data. Uh, so I think that actually when, we, when we're talking about patriarchy influencing certain things such as the gender pay gap, why aren't we looking at how lesbians are actually managing to supersede that and maybe we can learn something from them. You'd love to see a Kevin Myers column on this, wouldn't you? Yeah. Ain't gonna happen. Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Gentlemen over there, at the back of the room. Una, uh, thanks very much for the lecture, by the way. That was, uh, it was really great. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, oh, it's Gavin. Sorry, Gavin. I didn't see you that. I'm wearing a cap. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to know, Una, was do you see parallels between the marriage equality referendum and the repeal the eighth movement? And if you do see parallels, how do you turn a yes on marriage equality into a yes on abortion reform? Great question, Gav. Thanks. Um, I think that there are parallels in terms of energy and grassroots and all that kind of stuff. I think they are two completely different issues. I think that a lot has been learned in terms of mobilizing um, groups around the country and campaigning and all that kind of stuff. But I think in terms of the question that's being asked, it, it is kind of very different. However, it is also about fairness and kindness and how we want people to be treated in society. And I think that there is far more weight in asking Irish people, should we continue to allow our mothers and daughters and sisters and all that kind of stuff and women in general have to travel for medical care when they should be having it at home? Um, I think when, what, what I think, and you know, my arguments would be arguments around body autonomy, all that, you know, mm -hmm. That, that that's baseline and I don't think you can really talk about feminism or women's rights without the fa you know without autonomy I think it kind of makes everything else a bit bullshitty to be quite honest because that's where everything comes from but I think in asking Irish people to think about the people that they know and love and ask them are you happy for people to be traveling alone at a great cost themselves in isolation, in shame, and often in the aftermath in pain without proper checkups, etc. instead of having 
their medical care here. And I think that appeal uh, to kind of kindness and gentleness and, you know, heart is, is quite similar. But I think that they're, rather, you know, quite different, different questions, you know, in terms of a yes on, on marriage equality or a yes on free, safe and legal abortion. But I think that that appeal to the goodness of people and to the fairness of people is kind of central to both of them. And you, you accept it's morally consistent to have two different views on these things? Mo to yeah, be, well, to be I, yes for marriage equality and, and no for abortion reform. Well, people can have, have whatever yeah, opinions they want. It doesn't follow that, one, that the group that supports one's... No, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I, I don't think so at all. I think that you can have a plethora of opinions across yeah. everything. I mean, it wouldn't be... I mean, I am resolutely pro-choice and want yeah. free, safe and legal abortion north and south. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And, and pro-choice encompasses, you know, a spectrum of opinions. Um, but I think that there has been a lot learned from the mobilization of people and, and the type of conversations that are had with people from marriage equality going into repeal the eighth and, and in the north as well. Down the back of the room, this, this part, you have disappointed me, this whole, oh, there you go, thank you very much. Now you're waking up, good. Uh, down the back, then we'll come to here and then over here, great. Hi, Una. Um, what I wanted to ask about was, um, I think that a lot of people may be curious, particularly up here, uh, around the idea that the Republic has the first LGBTI plus uh, national youth strategy. Um, and maybe you could speak a little bit to the process that's involved in that. And also I'd be curious to hear from your point of view as an independent chair, as someone who's you know not involved in politics and in the everyday cut and thrust of government and whatnot, what, uh, from your uh, experience in that process so far, what the priorities are um, for you um, as part of that process and part of that strategy? Cool, thanks, Gav. Um, I think it is a deck. Do I just call you Gav? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gav. <laughs> Everybody's Gav. <laughs> Everybody's Gav. Thanks, yeah. Declan. Um, okay, so in terms of the... the the, the youth strategy itself, it was established by Minister Zapone. There's about 13 or 14 of us on the oversight committee and I'm the chair of it. The point of it is, as I was saying earlier, to kind of figure out how we can alleviate these obstacles that LGBTI plus people are, are facing. The strategy is going to be hopefully com you know, finished-ish by December. And what it's trying to do is, it has five outcomes that are identified in the Better Outcomes, Brighter Futures document that came out of the National Youth Strategy. This is all very boring policy stuff. <laughs> um, and there are various people at the table, the Department of Education, HSE, Department of Justice, the TUSLA, there's various LGBT plus youth, or, or just organizations in general, TENI belong to, the National uh, LGBT Helpline. And it's kind of about figuring out those gaps in the National Youth Strategy where LGBTI plus people have, you know, bigger needs that need to be filled in. Um, and the main gist of it is the consultation processes that we've done. So we've done an online consultation process and thousands of responses from, um, five or six national, uh, uh, regional consultations around the country, two in Dublin as well, and one stakeholder, one in Farmley. And, you know, the stuff that's coming out of it at the moment, we didn't use that the other week, is, 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 you know, really interesting because there are a lot of young people talking about sex education or non-existent sex education um, bullying, involvement in sports, all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's a big job to kind of pull a lot of that kind of stuff together. Um, in terms of priorities, the priorities are all being driven by consultation and by expertise in the area. We're doing a big research um, review at the moment as well. And 
in tandem with the oversight committee, there was also set up a youth advisory group solely made of young people. Three of those young people sit on the oversight committee. The young people were the people who presented the research at our family event recently. Um, so it's very much driven by that, that the young people have to be central to policy. The priorities are going to come out of the consultation stuff, which I think more of it will be um, out in, in August and September. Um, but it is like turbo exciting. Um, and I think that the thing that these things need is, is cross-departmental input and agreement because you need to have education and justice and health and, and the Department of Children, all these people on board. And you also need money, you need the resources and you need commitment across departments. And I think that we're very lucky to have a minister and Minister Zapone who, you know, has a really good record on these on these issues. Um, and what was your the second part of the question? Um, the second part was just about the priorities. So of which you kind of answered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that it'd be interesting to get what your personal priorities are from your own personal experience and having shared that so as opposed to what the stakeholder group priorities yeah, are. Yes, so, like I suppose my personal priorities would be um, I think we need to do a huge amount of work on HIV, young gay men in, in Ireland. We are in the midst of a massive HIV crisis that is not being addressed and is not being really covered at all. Um, uh, there are people, the, a person contracts HIV in the south of Ireland every 18 hours. Um, there are more people contracting HIV now year on year than there was at the height of the HIV crisis in the late 80s and early 90s. And that is not being talked about. You had a story this morning in the Irish Times about customs seizing PrEP. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's still not available at HSE. That's absolutely ridiculous, in my opinion, in my personal opinion. So that needs to be addressed. I think we need to look at um, education around sexual relationships and relationships in general in schools and the impact that 92% of our primary schools in the South being under the patronage of the Catholic Church has on that. Yeah. I think we need to look at the access that groups such as Shout Out have to schools, how that kind of relationship and social education can be embedded in our curriculum. And I think we need to look at um, you know, mental health resourcing, which is not just an LGBT I plus issue. Mm -hmm. It is a crisis in this country that has been ongoing north and south for years and years and years. And yet I don't see mental health A&Es and I don't see mental health mobile units mm. and I don't see um, any sense of urgency really to this being addressed, you know, and, and you can change behavior quite dramatically. Um, and I, I, if, if you have a multifaceted approach, and I think in terms of mental health issues, uh, you know, not just LGBT, I post, but I think across the board that needs to be addressed with a matter of urgency, and that would be a priority for me as well. And I think we need to look at other things. We need to look at gay conversion therapy. Um, we need to look at various things like that. Is gay conversion therapy still legal in the South? It's not illegal. It's not. But it's still permissible. Yeah. Is, is having a, we haven't mentioned the fact that Ireland has a gay t-shirt, a gay yeah. shirt, I guess we should say, uh, a gay, <laughs> a gay t-shirt. Uh, is, is, is Leo Varadkar likely to change the direction or the, uh, or the motion of some of these issues in the future? In the near future? I think he has in shown. The, in, the, in the three uh, weeks he's got left, no, no I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> however long he's got left in office. I think he has shown an enthusiasm for these things. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the site is also operating in this post glen environment. And one of the problems with that is the funding is, is, is gone. And Owen Murphy, somehow, the Minister for Housing, somehow found this funding for the LGBT helpline last week. Mm. That seemed very positive to me. I haven't seen somebody kind of, you know, acting like that before in quite, you know, with urgency. Um, I know Leo, Leo's coming, the T-shirt's coming here on um, <laughs> Friday and Saturday yeah. and attending the Pride Breakfast. I mean, that's interesting. <laughs> not no, walk, I mean, I not walking on the Pride? Yeah, no, I, th I think, well, you said you had to go back to, you had to see the 
Dover match, so it's we can't go to parade. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's really interesting, you know, and I think that, you know, the, you know, a lot of uh, the Tisha's politics I am not on board with, um, and I've been very critical of them over the years and very recently as well. But I also think that you need to work with people and that if he is willing to push certain things um, that are beneficial to LGBTI plus community, then of course you're going to take that, you know? Let's get a mic up. Oh, you've got it all right. Go ahead. I was actually just about to ask uh, the exactly inner right thoughts yeah, right. of Vice Chairman Levin Brackers, a gay teacher. No pressure, that. No pressure. Yeah, uh, so a quick question. I'll think of something else. Um, I was interested at the very start, before you started your lecture, you mentioned that uh, marriage equality should really be a red line issue before uh, we get before the assembly gets back up and running, or get to the assembly getting back up and running. Um, do, could that not, and does that not lend itself to politicians playing politics with our rights? They're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So at least try and make them do it in your favor. You know, that so sounds very cynical, but yeah, it, is, it uh, is the case. I suppose then the other argument is would, would we have maybe potentially, and maybe, I <laughs> suppose we even, uh, have marriage equality already, because with the previous assembly election, arguably the petition of concern wouldn't have been able to uh, hold back marriage equality any, any longer, but because marriage equality is a red line issue, it's one of the reasons we don't have an assembly. Yeah. A bit of a catch 23. I think the petition of concern needs to be looked at as well, and why does Sinn Féin want to hold on to it so much if they see it as the only opposition to marriage equality? Um, how dear is marriage equality? To their hearts, uh, if if that is the case, I think that I like I understand your playing politics thing that they might use marriage equality or rights issues to stymie the reconvening of the executive of the assembly. Um, I think that can be you know that could be quite transparent. That doesn't mean that that wouldn't happen, but I do think that. You know, unfortunately, I would love to think that loads of people in loads of governments are really want to get these things over the line for the greater good. But we just know that politics isn't like that. And I think that there needs to be leverage made uh, in other ways. I mean, I think that embarrassing people and shaming people into do, doing things is often a more powerful political tool than other things. I know that sounds again quite quite cynical, but you know, politicians and political parties care about optics, and often when uh, those things are leveraged, they have a greater impact than the begging bowl or whatever else. You know. So in Northern Ireland, we generally have to have a win-win on every issue to make progress on anything. Well, about. this is a win-win if there ever was a win-win. Um, over here, let's get the mic over here. Thank you. Anybody else over there on this side of the room? I'm, I'm prejudicing this side of the room for a bit. Yeah, yeah, it's like an auction, this. Um, there we go. And I'll take one more question in the room. One more question. Okay. Um, firstly, I'm sorry to digress, but I want to go back to the LGBTI youth strategy in the Republic. I'm, I'm someone from the Republic who lives here in the North and has for over 11 and a half years. Um, you've referred rightly to intersectionality as it relates to gender and LGBT issues. I would like to know the degree to which the national LGBTI youth strategy in the Republic is engaging with issues um, relating to people who are black and minority ethnic and also people who are disabled and deaf within the LGBT community. And I suppose I ask you this question in the context of the fact that there has been a historic invisibility of people who are disabled and deaf within the LGBT community, and also in the context of the fact 
that the sexuality of people who are disabled and deaf has been historically repressed, whether that is in an, an LGBT context or a heterosexual context. Mm. And uh, I suppose, and I would ask this question as a person who is proudly, unashamedly, unrepentantly, and unapologetically blind, and also as somebody who does not identify in binary forms in terms of my sexuality. And the other two quick points are, are there members of the disabled and or deaf community on the 14 person group that you're, um, uh, that you're chairing? And uh, would you also agree with me, you were talking about the need for greater cooperation uh, on equality issues around women's and LGBT issues, and that it actually might also be very, um, would you agree with me that it also might be very uh, important to do so on uh, racial issues and on disabled and deaf issues, and particularly as Brexit um, presents potential threats to uh, equality and human rights laws and equality and human rights standards that we've historically applied? I, I hope I've explained the question right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there, as far as I am aware, there are no um, disabled or blind or deaf people on the oversight committee. Um, in terms of people who have been invited as stakeholders uh, across our consultations, that has involved a broad spectrum of groups, including groups pertinent to the, the issues that you're raising, or demographics that you're yeah. raising, yeah. as along with belong to as well, who yes. I feel also d deal um, with, with, you. you're saying no? With, with no, no, oh, no, no, okay. I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Oh, yep. sorry, okay. Yep. Um, with those issues as well, that is something very, very pertinent to us. Northern Ireland, when we agree, we say no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the intersectionality in terms of race is something that I'm very conscious of, and especially in terms yeah. of migrant groups who've always been yeah. inv invited to yeah. stakeholder consultations. Yeah. Um, so that is something very much to the fore, but I, I don't think that it's to the fore enough in all of these conversations that we have, so I absolutely take your point on that. Um, the other question was about, that was... I said about great, yeah, you've answered two of them, um, um, uh, about greater cooperation across the other equality groups, and um, I'd be interested in hearing your views about tackling invisibility of minority groups within the LGBT as well. Yeah, I think that's... You know, I think in terms of tackling mm -hmm. invisibility of other, other groups, I think that's a huge issue, you yeah. know, and... and I, I don't, I think, you know, obviously everybody can do better on that. I think that that's where the intersectionality arc, like point that yes. you're raising is hugely pertinent because yes. we talk about diversity and we talk about representation yes. in very rudimentary terms yes. and we actually don't talk about the spectrum. So I absolutely take your point on that. And thank, thank you, you for asking. Oh, I appreciate your answer. Thank you. I, I generally find, I mean, we have, we, we have a problem with this in journalism, you know, the disabled person. Uh, is sometimes literally wheeled into a room to have to be part of a conversation about disability. Uh, why isn't that person welcome in a conversation about anything? Or we bring a Muslim person in to have a conversation about yep. Islam. Yep. Why are they not part of any other discussion? Or you know, a woman's you brought in to talk about feminism. You're, you're why, why can't the woman come yep. in to talk about just about everything? Just, just on the the like you mentioned, the kind of non-binary aspect to it as well. Like one of the things that we're very much in favour of on the strategy committee is extending the Gender Recognition Act yes. to recognise non-binary people and non-binary identifying people. So that is something that is very much to the fore as well. Uh, Patrick, in his Im immense grace, has granted us more time uh, than I thought we had. So we can take more questions, which means I'm going to shame this part of the room. Because uh, you're way too quiet. There we are. Thank you very much. I'll need someone else behind. Just put your hand in the air. You know you want to. Sorry to turn this into like Thank an you. evangelical altar call. There you are. We've got it. Uh, you're, you're saved. Over there. Hi, Thank you very much. Sorry, I'll stand up. Sorry, apologies to the people behind me because I know it's difficult. Um, you could tell by my accent, I'm also from the Republic and living here very happily. On a personal note, um, I'm, I'm interested in the tension there always is between continuity and change. And you've alluded to that, I think, in many ways, sometimes explicitly and implicitly. In other words, the battle isn't yet won. We have to sustain change and so on. And it relates, I think, to the earlier question about politics with a small p and a big p. And given that you were at the heart of the marriage equality process in the Republic, did you get a sense that some politicians were genuinely more committed to it for equality reasons than others? 
And yeah. what, what else could you say about that? I think so. I think, um, you know, I know that I s said that people kind of play politics with things, and I do, like, I do believe in that. I mean, I think the claiming of, of the journey <clears throat> by conservative politicians who were only interested in LGBT rights for a wet week was very evident. But I do think that, um, I mean, I think the Labour Party has kind of been written out of the marriage equality uh, process, here, here. maybe regrettably, um, because, you know, Leo Varadkar and Jerry Adams were on stage at Dublin Castle hugging Panty and stuff. Um, I, I, you know, I could maybe count on one, maybe two hands, the amount of times that I've heard Jerry Adams talk about LGBT rights issues. Uh, you know, sorry, not sorry, but that's that's the reality in, in the South for me anyway. I think um, some people went on very genuine, admirable journeys. You know, I think the likes of Simon Coveney yeah. was a fantastic um, example and representative of that. And he, you know, I, I believe that he genuinely did believe, did believe in, in what he was saying. And I think that you saw that across the board. I think what was funny for me was the much more conservative politicians um, who rose to the occasion in, in, in odd ways, you know, the likes of Charlie Flanagan and Fine Gael, um, who was, you know, quite vocal on this issue. Um, but then, you know, you look at, you know, from, you know looking at Enda Kenny, um, I remember going to a book launch the year after the marriage referendum that was about the marriage referendum and he was just espousing all this stuff and I, I actually felt quite offended um, by his claiming of LGBT rights. Um, you know, he was going full scale Harvey Milk, like, you know, and it just felt so cynical to me. Um, so I think some people got it and some people didn't. and. Some people canvassed and some people didn't. You know, I, I saw very few Fianna Fáil people on the streets. And yet, you know, the Labour councillors in Dublin were, <laughs> you, I mean, I don't even know if they slept. I'm not a Labour person, by the way, but I'm just saying that as, as, as a reality. <laughs> Thanks, Gav. It's Dirk, I know, yeah. <laughs> Shade. Um, so I think that um, some people got it and some people didn't, and some people, I mean, you look, the likes of Gary Gannon, Social Democrats, you know, was, was really good, good on those things, and I don't know, I think if you're, if, I think if you're, uh, I think if you wanted to play politics or capitalize on something that was actually genuinely mon monumental, you were going to do it anyway. I think if you really cared about public service and saw the change that was about to happen, you got it. And I think when you saw the likes of Noel Whelan, for example, you know, former Fianna Fáil strategist, just like crying on, on Dame Street on the 20, 23rd of May, then you're like, okay, no, so some people did really get it. I don't know if that answers your question, sorry. <laughs> I thought it would sound like a psychiatric assessment of politicians. Um, over there, someone else behind, I think, had a hand up earlier. You got Mina, a Go ahead. how are you? Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic uh, presentation and lecture this evening. Uh, the word you just used a moment ago was journey, and I think it's a very fitting uh, word that captures both the journey you've shared with us this evening in a very inspiring way. And of course, I think everybody in this room uh, can relate to being on a journey, uh, particularly on, on this issue. A lot of the work that I try to do um, in my day job is bring together individuals and groups of people who may passionately and fundamentally disagree with each other, which, as you can imagine, in Northern Ireland is particularly interesting at times. Be and, busy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, one of the things that I, I am interested in is how you help to create the space to bring people on their own journey. And it, it's where I, I just, it's perhaps the nuance of Northern Ireland when it comes to this issue. I absolutely agree with you in terms of the trauma that many people went through because of the referendum in the South, and, and many of those people uh, are, are friends of mine. 
But the, the one thing it did do is it allowed people to come out that perhaps a political party or a group that, that they were associated with, uh, they were able to distance themselves on this issue and say, well, actually, no, I disagree with you on that, that point. And I, I, it's where I, I, I just slightly challenge, I, I don't have the answer, but I just like to, I wonder whether some kind of referendum here, some kind of debate would allow people that perhaps uh, are affiliated with a political, politi political party, uh, which is against marriage equality, to be able to come out from that shadow and express themselves differently. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there as a, Yeah, there's as no a, doubt that that, that that, you know, occurs. I mean, um, you know, there's no doubt that that can also be valuable. Um, my my issue with it that I mean if if is is the perspective and the honesty of the arguments because a lot of the arguments that I heard weren't honest. If you are against marriage equal marriage gay people marrying because you just don't think gay people should get married, that you just you're not into it, etc. Just say that. Because a lot of the arguments that were heard were like, well, if this happens, then this will happen. And actually, it's not about, uh, I, I have no problem with people getting married, but it's just this, you know, like, or they'll redefine it, or blah, blah, blah. So I feel like if you are against gay people getting married, for whatever reason, there might be reason that's rooted in religion, or, or, or homophobia, or whatever, say it, you know, be honest about your argument. I would have far more respect for somebody saying, I don't want gay people to get married because I actually don't think they should be allowed to get married because I don't really like them. I would say, well, do you know what? At least you actually say it and I know where you stand. Because the arguments that emerged were, were, were disingenuous. They were false, they were, you know, and, 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 and it just met, it's very difficult to argue when somebody doesn't believe what they're saying, they're trying to find an avenue in which to make it palatable. So absolutely, you know, ha ha have those debates, but you also have to acknowledge the, you know, if you are challenging someone, is your challenge rooted in privilege? Is a reaction rooted in privilege? Uh, do you have, you know, the decorum and respect for other people? And do you understand that what you say might actually hurt them? And are you prepared to, to kind of think about that? But I mean, a lot of the arguments that I heard weren't honest because I know people who were arguing against them were doing it from positions of homophobia and they would not admit that. I would have had far more respect for people if they did. Because then at least we know where people stand and then you can actually have an argument because my argument is genuine. Do you think all arguments against same-sex marriage are homophobic? No. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> someone disagrees with you. I think, <laughs> no, because I think you can have an argument against same-sex marriage that is against marriage We'll stop. No, but I mean, somebody who supports marriage as marriage being one man, one woman, supports that idea of marriage, but doesn't want same-sex marriage, is that always and only homophobic? I think it's rooted in a distaste for how you perceive uh, what gay people should have or have not. And that is rooted in prejudice, and that prejudice is homophobia. So it's a yes, it's, it's always homophobic. Yeah, however, yeah. there is an argument against marriage that isn't homophobic. Yeah, there's, there's a degree, yeah, I understand the same structures. I do, I do, I mean, I, you know, I, yeah. I think that if you could say, um, I'm allowed to do this, and you're not allowed to do that. Why am I not allowed to do that? Because you're gay. Why am I not allowed to do that because you're gay? Because I don't like the fact that you might be allowed to do that when you're gay. Why? Because I don't like the fact that you're gay. Why? Because I don't like gay people. I mean, I mean, it dilutes down to that. And I think it should, like, I think that there was obviously during the referendum before it, this huge opposition to calling out homophobia where it stands. And I really think that you should be allowed to say, you know, if you don't like gay people, if you think gay people should not be able to access the institutions that you can access, you can't really hide other things. I mean, it might be a religious ideology. That's fine, but you know, a lot of those ideologies are rooted in prejudice and bigotry. Like my parents are pensioners. They're from rural Ireland. They're mass-going Catholics, and and they, you know, firmly and really, really believe in their religion. They go on pilgrimages to, you know, go 
see Padre Pio stuff in Italy and all that kind of stuff. And, and I have absolute respect for, for them and for their religion and for their faith. But they're Christians also. And, and that is rooted in charity and kindness. And if my parents, you know, who were 70 and 69, from Banlaslow in Galway and Virginia in Cavan, who go to Mass every week in Alvinas and value all of that doctrine and brought us up as Catholic, which I subsequently defected from, but that's another story. If they can say, I have my faith and I understand that and I am strong in it, but people in society should be allowed equality, then that's, you know, how, how, you know, that is, that is what you're looking for because faith is not necessarily a thing that should um, be used to discriminate against other people, but it's still very valuable to people and should be protected. So that's how I feel about it. Is that Declan again? Or is it Gav? <laughs> you guys must make a fortune as a double act. Um, not Gav, Declan. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, no, what, what I'm interested in hearing your opinion on, Una, is that uh, during the time of the referendum, there was um, a concentrated effort towards maintaining a positive tone throughout the campaign in terms of let's not attack uh, the no side, despite the fact that they were attacking us. Um, um, and also now we have... An, I personally am part of the, the campaign for love equality um, up here in the north and we're very measured in terms of how we interact with or respond to comments that come from the DUP for example and that's not really uh, something that we should be saying publicly but obviously this is pride so we can. Um, but I just wonder what your opinion is on that. Oh, the people watching terms... at home on these cameras are going to yeah. be really interested in what you are but um, what your opinion is on that in terms of really measuring that tone and how much do we have to indulge the no side? How much do we have to indulge the DUP, the Mike Pence's, the own institutes, etc., in terms of how we interact with them and how we don't call them out for their homophobia, for their prejudice, etc.? I think you can, I mean, I think that that's a really good question. The tone of the campaign was such a victory for the yes side, but um, it's very difficult, obviously. I mean, for me, I think that you can kind all is fair in love and war before a, re before a specific campaign has begun. I mean, obviously it's different here because um, that you're not going to have a referendum campaign. So there's no specific date where everybody has to start to be nice. Um, but I think that, unfortunately, like as we know, the people who are oppressed always have to be way more polite than their oppressors. And that's, you know, not a, a nice thing to have to admit, but that's just the way it is. You're always going to be more scrutinized and you have to be more dignified um, in confronting your oppression than the people who are doing unto you. I think that homophobia and prejudice has to still be called out, but it can be called out in very measured clinical ways. Without using those words. Um, I wonder if you deploy well, the Well, I think if something if is very explicitly homophobic. Yeah, but I wonder strategically if you were to deploy the word homophobia, if how persuasive that's likely to be in, if, you, if your ambition Well, I think that's part of mind. a very difficult thing where people who are gay are now not allowed to call things homophobic when they are. You know, and I'm not sure if, if it's, it's, I understand the strategy of it, but I'm not sure if it's helpful towards our collective mental health to somehow deny us that word when it's right in front of us. Um, I think you can very much counter it. And I think the fact is the more, it's the classic thing of like how you approach something is the reaction that you get back. Mm. And in the end, Certainly in the South, the respect that the Yes campaigners earned was because of such a measured tone. Um, and obviously the No campaigners grew increasingly hysterical. But I think, you, I think you can continue to call it out, but in a very dignified way. And, and you just kind of have to find the middle ground for that. But 
Yeah. Time for a couple more. And we dined to ask a question. Gentlemen over here, I think. I can't see anybody. <laughs> That's why I'm going to blast it off. So, yes. The silhouette over there. That's it. Right. Go ahead. June, the. Uh, oh. Congratulations, June, on the, uh, the talk. Very interesting. Uh, during the. Uh, oh, I'm another uh, blow in as well. Uh, during the, uh, the referendum, the diaspora had a, had a big impact and it brought the message home that uh, yeah. everybody, whether it was a son or a daughter, had a family at home mm. and they knew that there was, there was somebody in the family. I guess that dynamic isn't really going to play in the North because you don't ha necessarily have that uh, dominant vote. So I guess that that's possibly a question for both of you. Well, yeah, it's worth it. We, I, we haven't talked about it yet. It was a very significant part of this uh, referendum, the, the home to vote. Yeah, it was. I think experience. it was more publicised outside of it Ireland. Probably was. Yeah. Um, but I think it was. It was significant. And the internet loved it. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, the Home to Vote campaign was, was amazing and was very special um, in terms of, uh, you know, number of votes or whatever. I'm not sure it had, like, the seismic impact that it had, but it was one of those other, like, viral moments of, of the campaign in terms of, you know, utilising that here. I mean, how many people uh, live in the Republic yeah. who can vote in the North? I met one who flew home from Australia. Yeah, I mean, I mean to vote and went back. Yeah, but I mean, there's, I mean, the fact is, the referendum situation is not going to happen here. I mean, no, I really don't think. Um, but I think, in terms of the perception of the North in the South, in the UK, you know, that those are those things that can be leveraged because, you know, a lot of the time things only become compounded when other people are looking at them. Mm. And, and that's what the home to vote thing was about. Patrick. Let's get Patrick the microphone. Uh, if there's anybody else, it will be the last question. I have been discriminated against this side of the room for a while. Uh, your sanctions have been lifted. So anybody on, on this side of the room, you can have a question. Yeah, I, I just thought I'd come in actually on this because I think it's an interesting question. So we're not going to have a referendum. Uh, however, uh, there is a diaspora community, not just people from the north living in the south, but living in GB. Uh, we don't have a government here. We do have a government in London, however, who are in partnership with one of our largest party, who are the main blockage to equal marriage. And so we have an interesting political dynamic. And we have on the we, we talked earlier about the campaign for abortion reform on both sides of the border. Well, that was an issue where we have seen significant change in terms of access to abortion for women from Northern Ireland brought just in recent weeks because of that very interesting political dynamic and because of the deal that the UP did with the Conservatives in spite of that deal. Uh, and I think there will be a, a further interesting opportunity, particularly if we end up in a position of clear direct rule rather than devolution in another month or two, because there are many Conservative <laughs> backbenchers and backbenchers of all parties who have voted against voted for equal marriage in their own jurisdiction, who see a clear injustice, uh, who have constituents who are there to put pressure on them, to lobby them. Uh, in London, we, we see that the London Irish Abortion Rights Campaign that's working to bring some of that pressure to bear on politicians there for the benefit of women and girls on both sides of the border here. So I think there, there is a way to leverage people outside of Northern Ireland and politicians outside of Northern Ireland yeah, for social change here. So. What, what, I, what I would ask for that, and, and I don't know that much about it, but where is the lobbying in Westminster on behalf of marriage equality in Northern Ireland? Well, civil, because, part, civil partnerships came here yeah, but, in the context of direct rules, simply yeah. because they were imposed. Yeah, but, is that your suggestion that might happen again? Uh, so, uh, there is, uh, particularly in, in the case of uh, direct rule, when Westminster ministers have responsibility for everything here, including whether or not we have equal marriage, yeah. I have absolutely zero doubt uh, that this, the issue of equal marriage uh, will be pushed on to the Westminster stage. It isn't there at the moment because they can't do quite the, the what they did in terms of access on NHS England. The, the, the mechanism isn't quite there. However, if they have legislative responsibility 
on all issues here, it most certainly will be coming there, and it, um, it's an issue that uh, if you ask who, who's, who's going to be talking about it, well, Amnesty certainly will be talking about yeah. it to all of our political There would also be a huge irony there in the banana the DUP makes a so-called deal with the Conservatives that marriage equality could be introduced by a director. could just be that Patrick's an optimist, because <laughs> it, it might be that we get a kind of light, light touch direct rule uh, where, it, where the government stays away from the... They will, they will want to, whether they can, uh, whether, the, the, yeah. whether the Commons... Anyway, the if pressure will be wrong to bear. Pass. And I should also make clear, we want it to happen via the Northern Ireland Assembly, sure, yes. via our legislators, not via proxy English MPs. Mm. Final question of the evening. Mm. Who would like that honour? It's a massive honour. It's a distinction. There you are. Thank you very much. In a good speech, thank you. Um, you kind of mentioned in it that good things come to those who wait or something of that nature. Um, I am actually married, just not in this country. You obviously, uh, down south, waited a considerable time. I'm just curious, on a leaving note, how long would you have waited for marriage equality to come in? If you think we should still wait because it's going to be absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I think, uh, I think I probably would have left Ireland if the referendum hadn't passed. So in short, don't wait. Yeah, I, don't th I think demand. What, is that, what does that mean? What's the alternative to waiting? I mean, Demanding. I mean, it's protest. Like, it's, you it's mean emigrate? Act, you know. no, that's, I'm just you curious because it was kind of like... Go get married somewhere else and come, come back and, ha and have it... Well, that's, what I, civil that's fundamentally what I did. But yeah. what, what I mean is... If, if legislation, which is what you're suggesting, is our only route to doing it, what are the point in these social media campaigns? Where is the, the visibility of a day to day? You know, how are we actually going to succeed if we just have to wait for legislation to happen on this kind because of Because I think legislation doesn't happen in a vacuum. Legislation, what happens with pressure yes. on, on, you know, on, on politicians who who's, will be their job to legislate on that. So the pressure needs to be maintained on them, whether that's done by protest, whether it's done by the fact that the public will become so overwhelming that they'll be absolutely scarlet if they don't do it, whether it comes down to chaining yourself to the gates, or whether it comes down to lobbying or saying you're not going to vote for people, or whether it comes down to anything. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I understand that why that's why the temptation for referendums can be there, because then you can feel like, well, at least I can have my say. But I, you know, I absolutely sympathise and I empathise because I wouldn't be living in Ireland right now um, after going through, if, if having, I mean, that's the other thing as well. Having politicians turn around and say, no, you're not equal, is very different to having the population turn around and say, no, you're not equal. That is a big deal for, for that to happen, so. I'm not, I'm not interested in a referendum, I genuinely yeah, but agree I, with I, you in terms I, of the politics. How yeah. long do we actually have to wait in this country for our politicians to kind of recognise that there are people here? The country's gone through seismic changes in so many ways, yet it is so slow in, in something I'm else. With so you. what I are we know. not doing? Yeah. What are we actually not doing? Because something's not happening. I, I can't answer that. But I, I, but I absolutely, Anyone? I know, like I, I, I completely empathise with your frustration. Oh, okay, you seem really keen, so we'll, we'll, we'll squeeze one more. Uh, let's get the mic over there. We're cooperating, passing the mic from one side of the room to the other. Hi, thanks, Fiona. That's lovely uh, for your discussion. Um, maybe I can answer that um, quickly. I'm good to respond to <laughs> the questions. Um, it's the people maybe who are going in yeah. to the politicians. Yeah. So that would be the answer. You, you say go get elected. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone, Una Malali. <laughs>